All right. So thanks for everyone uh, for joining uh, from wherever you are, whatever time zone you may be in. Um, I'm glad you can be a part of our uh, lecture series. Um, this uh, Eric uh, Mumford's uh, lecture is going to be part of a uh, series by our faculty who have generously agreed uh, to lecture on their research. Um, historians are the core of any school and Eric, along with the other historians in this series, have demonstrated the depth of knowledge uh, within our school. Uh, Eric is an active member of the Society of Architectural Historians and is highly regarded among his peers. Uh, as an example of a, a conversation I once had with uh, Corey Beek, who is an alumni of uh, the undergraduate program, had gone off to uh, Columbia University uh, for his master's degree and told me a story of when he attended the first day of Kenneth Frampton's history class. Uh, and and um, Mr. Frampton announced that if anyone had taken Eric Mumford's class, that they could waive his history class. Uh, didn't mention any other anyone else, only, uh, only if you had uh, attended Eric's class. Um, Eric's uh, research is on urbanism, in particular, uh, knowledge of the avant-garde urbanism, uh, Siam and Team 10, but also urbanism in relationship to social and political forces. He's authored uh, quite a few books. Uh, Designing the Modern City, Urbanism Since 1850, which is the latest book. Uh, the writings of uh, Jose Luis Assert, um, Defining uh, Urban Design, CM Architects and the Formation of a Discipline, 1937 to 69. Uh, Jose Luis Assert, uh, The Architect of Urban Design, 1953 to 69. Uh, Positioning Positions, Modern Architecture and Urbanism, Histories and Theories and Modern Architecture in St. Louis, Washington University and Post-War American Architecture, 1948 to 1973. So as you can see, Eric is uh, positioned ideally for our school because we span urban design, architecture and landscape. And in relationship to tonight's lecture, uh, Eric's research connects uh, Louis Search with an, as an important architect that was one of the earliest proponents of urban design uh, Sturt started to use the term urban designer relationship to issues he was exploring in Siam. Um, so urban design, and now quoting Eric, uh, Sturt uh, defined it. Uh, this field was an effort to define a new profession where architecture, landscape architecture, and city and regional planning all overlapped. So Eric's work in publishing the writings of uh, Jose Luis Sturt um, helped clarify misconceptions of his work and contribution to the profession. Uh, so as also as Eric stated, uh, because Sert himself never published much about his own work uh, and ideas after his early uh, collective Siam publications. So the, you know, the questions of urban design uh, are broad and complex, yet very timely in terms of recent social and political events. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, Eric's uh, discussion. So um, uh, with that, um, Eric, um, please take it away. Well, thank you, Chandler. It's a really great introduction. It's always nice to have people read the books. <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> and um, thanks also to Robert McCarter and uh, Dean Colangelo, Director Wolfer, uh, for this uh, invitation. Um, I'm going to try to talk about Sert um, in a kind of overall way. I, I think probably some of you know who he was. I had a, a kind of rare chance to actually see him in person when I was an undergraduate at Harvard in the early 1970s and the mid 1970s. And um, that left a lifelong uh, impression on me, although I only met him once where he actually gave a, a lecture, a guest lecture uh, in a course where he talked about his work on the Harvard campus. Uh, but his focus on uh, urbanism, on pedestrian urbanism and fitting new buildings into old buildings, uh, I found really very compelling. And so I think ever after that, I, I was always very interested uh, in his work. And um, it was kind of a surprise to discover when I started working on Siam in my dissertation at Princeton in the early 1990s, that Sir had actually been the president of Princeton, uh, the president of Siam uh, in, uh, later on in its history after 1947. So um, that was... Um, those are reasons, really, which are personal reasons as well as, um, of course, field reasons. And 
other aspects of search work, search work, I think are also extremely interesting and maybe still very contemporary. Um, he started to modify uh, Siam ideas uh, in relation uh, to his idea of the Mediterranean, that uh, for him, uh, the uh, Mediterranean towns, some of which go back to you know, even prehistoric times or places like the Giza, where he ultimately retired, uh, founded by the Phoenicians in something like 450 BC. But these kinds of urban environments that had persisted over long periods of time were for him very important, um, not necessarily to literally replicate, but to try to understand the sorts of logics, the social and building logics that had produced them and which allowed them to sustain themselves over very long uh, time periods. And so I certainly wouldn't argue that CERT was the inventor of urban design as you might understand it broadly. Uh, he was certainly coming out of a whole tradition uh, that developed uh, in the 18th century and then uh, became a really major aspect of the building of cities after that. But um, he nonetheless did define this discipline and in some ways name it in the 1950s when he was dean at the Harvard GSD. By that point, he had been um, involved in Siam really since uh, 1929 when he attended the second Siam Congress in Frankfurt. Uh, he knew many of the participants. Um, the fifth Siam Congress was a very important event where after um, almost a decade of uh, the groups being uh, out of contact with each other, many in, in Europe uh, under direct Nazi occupation. Some members actually uh, spent time in concentration camps, some were killed. And so after the war, uh, this, this reunion Congress held in England, but really kind of looking in a way toward the United States, where CERT was in residence, had been in residence since 1939, a very important moment in kind of reorganizing modern architecture, moving it away from some of the overtly political uh, positions of the pre-war period, which actually spanned the political spectrum. You had CM members like Giuseppe Perani, who was a, a committed fascist, and then you also had many uh, communist members as well, some of whom after World War II then became uh, members of uh, socialist realist groups, uh, which were not uh, approved of by Siam uh, in the East Bloc as it fell under Soviet domination. So a very important complex period where CERT was able in a kind of diplomatic way to become uh, the president of Siam and try to introduce uh, new ideas uh, into the group. Um, Siam, of course, had been founded in 1928. Um, it was really about overthrowing the Bozar system. Uh, very much a radical agenda. You can sort of ask what was radical urbanism in the late 1920s, 1930s, and I think Siam uh, kind of gives a clear answer to that, the idea that uh, housing and town planning should be the focus uh, for the masses, not for, for the kinds of elites that had typically uh, been able to afford to build uh, before that, and uh, also uh, the use of new technologies, of prefabrication, um, new ways of conceptualizing habitation, lots of early debates, interesting debates in CM that I won't go into about all of that, but um, certainly something that uh, commanded the allegiance of a lot of different architects uh, from the late 1920s uh, forward. Cert himself uh, was, uh, he came from a rather elite background in Barcelona, had studied uh, in the Beaux-Arts program uh, in Barcelona, and then uh, on his own initiative went to Paris, worked in Le Corbusier's uh, atelier where he met uh, some of his lifelong uh, CM associates, uh, Maya Calafunio in Japan, one of the key figures to bring uh, modern architecture uh, into Japan, uh, the mentor of people like uh, Kenzi Tenga later on, and um, people like uh, Ernest Weissmann at that time, based in Zagreb in what was then Yugoslavia, and then later moving to the United States in 1939 and becoming an important figure in the United Nations housing and town planning efforts uh, after World War II. So this experience in Le Corbusier's office um, was formative for CERT, where he was really introduced uh, to Le Corbusier's then very radical ideas about uh, simultaneously rejecting Beaux-Arts traditions of urbanism and at the same time appropriating aspects of mostly American technology or things like uh, the skyscraper, which was very much uh, on view in places like Manhattan and Chicago, and uh, taking that and trying to uh, in some way uh, reorganize it, to create models of the city, which Le Corbusier was in no way able to build at that time, but which became very much uh, sort of iconic projects, inspiring lots of people like Ludwig Hilversheimer and many other urbanists uh, from the 1920s forward. What actually isn't as well known is that, although Le Corbusier's, um, in a sense, target of this urbanism was the way Paris had been built in the 19th century, which though many of us, of course, admire a great deal, but uh, this idea of a dense city of long uh, boulevards and 
um, the, the six story high apartment houses with shops at the ground level was exactly what Le Corbusier saw as the problem, that he wanted to somehow uh, rebuild the city in a different kind of way. It was at a point where French urbanists were actually very active around the world. There's a whole term urbanism had been introduced in 1910 by uh, Henri Post, a French architect largely forgotten today, who was very active uh, in what was then French dominated Morocco doing a plan for Casablanca in 1917, uh, plans for other uh, North African cities and eventually involved in the planning of Istanbul in the, in the late 1930s. Uh, someone who, um, and also very involved in Paris itself with the um, planning of what became the periphery for the highway that rings uh, central Paris. Uh, all these kinds of efforts, part of an idea really of um, urbanism that would be highly organized, that would give cities a kind of clear visual image where there would be very clear distinction of districts, uh, boulevards would connect to different functions, which would be uh, very clearly and precisely delineated, and new technologies like the railway, railways or ports facilities uh, would be a major aspect. So it's this effort to kind of integrate technical, social, uh, landscape elements, which really preceded Le Corbusier's work, and in fact was actually much more extensively applied than Le Corbusier himself was able to do as a kind of young avant-garde architect in Paris uh, in the 1920s. And it's quite interesting really that that whole approach to urbanism actually has left a large mark on much of the world, not only in Africa, as David Ajay has pointed out in his book on African architecture, uh, but also in Latin America as well. And so that whole tradition, I think, is really what Le Corbusier was kind of coming out of, reacting to, and then I think later on, Cert, in some ways, re-engaging aspects of that in ways that Le Corbusier himself was not really uh, interested in doing, particularly this idea of the pedestrian street, lining the street with shops, uh, trying to, in some way, create these pedestrian environments uh, that uh, much of the mid 20th century was largely uh, against in certain ways. Um, so Sert, after working in the Cabrizia's office, returned uh, to Barcelona. He uh, began to build uh, these apartments, uh, the Muntaner apartments, one of his early works, uh, already showing his sort of mastery in some ways of fairly complex housing uh, programs, fitting the units together with these double height, Le Cabrizia type uh, spaces, but also introducing new elements uh, that reflected his own interests in Mediterranean vernacular and also in various aspects of new technology. So after 1929, when he became a member of CM, uh, he uh, hosted uh, the first CM meeting outside of Northern Europe, which was held in Barcelona in 1932. Uh, Le Corbusier also in attendance. This was uh, right after the Spanish Republic had been declared the first democratic government in the history of Spain. Uh, very quickly challenged a few years later by General Franco and uh, his um, effort to overthrow it, which was ultimately successful in 1939. And so during that brief period, Cert and uh, his associates in the uh, Barcelona CM group started to bring CM ideas into uh, Barcelona, looking uh, to uh, other CM groups, the Swiss group of uh, very advanced housing that still exists in Zurich uh, today, uh, examples really of this idea of the existence minimum design not only in terms of a minimal housing, but also in relationship to nature, recreation, collective facilities, things like daycare centers and um, other kinds of collective uh, activities. Um, also, CERT would have been very aware of the debates going on in CM, which culminated in CM3 in Brussels, uh, a debate about high rise versus low rise that many of the uh, German speaking members who are also typically very much committed uh, socialists or communists were not in favor of high rise construction, which they saw as too expensive. The cost of the elevators and the steel framing for them made it seem more like a bourgeois kind of housing type. But Walter Gropius Le Corbusier very much in favor of the high rise as something that they saw as if it could simply be tall enough uh, you could actually house more in people inexpensively on a given piece of land. And so Gropius's famous diagrams, which ultimately then influenced a lot of post-World War II housing, uh, showing how uh, you could actually cover less of the site by going taller, and that this would then uh, preserve more open space. And so that whole debate really ongoing in Siam uh, throughout much of its history. In the Barcelona plans that CERT begins to uh, prepare with Le Corbusier and his other uh, associates in the Siam group there called GACTPAC, uh, that this, um, these plans for Barcelona involved both mid-rise uh, districts at the periphery of the existing city, uh, which would be designed along the lines of Le Corbusier's radiant city type housing, and also uh, various new towers of different forms in the different drawings uh, for a new business center adjacent to a new port that would front uh, the, air, the, the city in front of the uh, old town. The old town itself would be uh, partly cleared, although not entirely. I think this reflecting 
asserts ideas even at this point that Le Corbusier would have readily suggested uh, the entire old city be removed. Uh, Cert instead proposing that parts of it, the most historic parts be retained and then other parts cleared out to allow uh, for uh, light and air. Very much in line with a lot of the slum clearance housing reform thinking that really had roots back into the 19th century in cities like London, and which then uh, were kind of accelerated in some sense in Le Corbusier's uh, re rhetoric, although not necessarily uh, in his practice in the 1930s. A lot of these ideas also um, were published in the magazine AC, uh, Contemporary Activities, uh, published by the uh, Spanish CM group, a very good source even today. If you're interested in CM in the 1930s and search ideas uh, at that time. And so here you see some of the drawings of the, um, the renovation of the old city, the Gothic quarter, and uh, the expansion of the city with these uh, what are called Redon housing blocks, uh, similar to what Le Corbusier had proposed uh, earlier. There's also a regional dimension though to the Barcelona plan, this idea of uh, organizing the whole territory, really an, an emerging idea in Siam in the 1930s, uh, influence of people like Patrick Geddes, important, uh, not looking only at uh, old uh, commercial cores, but also at the larger regional uh, environment in which people lived and which factories resided, issues of transportation, uh, also important here you see uh, sketching for the new port, new uh, transportation routes, and what was proposed to be a leisure city so that the workers uh, could spend their one day off a week uh, at the seaside, which CERT also then made plans for uh, published uh, in AC. Out of all of this, only a few projects actually built, uh, CERT's anti-tuberculosis clinic, and then uh, the Casa Block apartments, uh, which uh, still exist. Fortunately, today it's now been preserved uh, and restored. Uh, gallery access project where the uh, units are double height. And um, there's an idea that these galleries can be places of social interaction, social mingling, the climate of Barcelona allowing for uh, this kind of um, more outdoor uh, sort of living. Uh, very carefully organized, uh, technically advanced uh, building methods being used and a lot of emphasis play, placed on modularity, which will continue to be a focus of search a housing work where a lot of flexibility in the planning so different types of units, multiple bedrooms, uh, single person units and so on uh, could all be organized within these larger frameworks, which would also allow for flexibility in terms of the various uses of indoor outdoor spaces uh, and so on. Parts of um, this uh, project, I think actually of this particular unit has been restored. And I thank um, Emiliano Lopez and um, Monica Rivera for sending me these photographs, which I think convey very well a lot of search uh, housing intentions at this point uh, in the 1930s. Much of them then published in AC, uh, not necessarily a mainstream part of CM at this point, but um, tying in the CM's focus on what they started to call the functional city in the 1930s, uh, this idea of beginning to look at natural factors as well as human ones in ways that ought in a sort of a significant way anticipate a lot of the post-war teaching of urban design that certainly then take up uh, in the 1950s. And many of these ideas also discussed at CM4 in 1933, um, where the Congress had been proposed for the or plan for the Soviet Union for Moscow in 1932. Uh, Stalin had sent in that time decided that um, he wasn't interested in Western avant-garde ideas, which he saw as emblematic of bourgeois decadence. And so instead, the, uh, the group had to meet on a cruise ship that sailed from Marseille to Athens, where there was an exhibition of the same scale plans uh, that had been prepared by the different CM groups, including the Barcelona CM group. Uh, and then the further deliberations on the voyage back from Athens uh, to Marseille. And so that a, a particularly important point for CERT's emergence uh, in Siam, the uh, more left-wing German members had largely been marginalized by the, at this point. They had moved to the Soviet Union to work there in the early 30s. And then Stalin's uh, change of policy meant uh, many of them like Hannes Meyer, Ernst Mai, uh, and others uh, had then uh, left the Soviet Union and um, into exile in various other places. And so this left Le Corbusier as kind of the key figure in CM, even though he didn't really have a lot of work uh, at this point, but was enormously energetic in uh, sort of spreading these ideas, eventually published what was called the Athens Charter in Paris in 1943, uh, which was his version sort of of the outcome of these deliberations at CM4. Uh, in his own version of it, high rise being very much an important aspect of the rebuilding of cities and also of uh, almost total clearance. Those ideas not necessarily shared by all the other members. Uh, CERT, uh, even in the 30s, interested in vernacular uh, kinds of um, Mediterranean architecture, the whole issue of AC uh, devoted to that, in particular, the uh, island of Ibiza focus for CERT even at this point, the Catalan-speaking island, once part of the empire, 
that had been centered uh, in Barcelona and a very rich tradition of vernacular building, which for Sert was as important in some ways as Le Corbusier's uh, ideas. Uh, also around this time, the Spanish Republic going into crisis in 1937, they um, uh, erected a pavilion in Paris at the 1937 exhibition to uh, kind of promote ironically tourism in, in the Spanish Republic. Sert was a charge of this project working with a kind of government architect, Luis La Casa, and also Anthony Bonnet, who worked in uh, Le Corbusier's office and then went on to Argentina shortly afterwards, where he became a very important architect uh, in Buenos Aires. The Spanish Pavilion was an effort to um, somewhat shift direction from the earlier functionalism of Siam to begin to put a new focus on the arts. Uh, Sert uh, had already been interested in modern art. He was friends with uh, Juan Miro, uh, the Spanish painter, and uh, also befriended Alexander Calder, the American sculptor who was living in Paris in the mid-1930s. Uh, this project uh, put their work uh, on display as well as the work of Pablo Picasso, already well-established modern artist since the, since the invention of Cubism around 1910. And uh, Picasso's big mural, Guernica, which commemorated uh, the Spanish um, uh, right-wing bombing of the town of, uh, of this Basque town using uh, basically bombers that had been provided by uh, Hitler and Mussolini, a kind of tryout really for World War II. Uh, the, mar the market, uh, busiest day of, of market in, was the point where it was decided that uh, the whole town would be flattened, and many people killed. And so the painting uh, commemorating that event, that horrific event, and then uh, becoming a kind of symbol of anti-fascism in the late 1930s. It was then exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in 1939 at the time of the New York World's Fair. And so this, this project kind of marks a point in Sert's career where he begins to reposition modern architecture away from uh, the earlier association with uh, communism, to some extent with the Soviet Union, into a more international kind of uh, anti-fascism, which was not necessarily linked directly to communism per se, but was very much uh, developing in this context right before World War II and the rise of Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco uh, in Spain. So it's at that point that uh, a number of CM members begin to emigrate to the United States. Um, uh, Walter Gropius had been hired as the uh, new chair of architecture at Harvard in 1937, a year before that. Uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design had been created at the behest of the president of Harvard, uh, James Bryant Conant. Uh, the idea was to combine what had been separate professional schools uh, into a single uh, graduate school of design. And here design meaning something different than it may mean perhaps in the Fox School today, uh, really about the design of the built environment, about planning, architecture, landscape design. And the idea being really to combine these things into a single program where the students would ideally take collaborative studios where these various issues would all be addressed uh, in a comprehensive way. A lot of this reflecting Joseph Pudnut's ideas, the dean uh, of uh, Harvard at the time, who had been dean at Columbia just before that, where he had modernized the curriculum, basically banished the Beaux-Arts curriculum, following the kind of the ideas of Siam really at that point. And a lot of that because he saw that in the uh, depression that many of the commissions for architects were actually large public housing projects, team-based public housing projects, rather than the kind of bazaar monumental buildings that had been built uh, up through the 1920s. And so it's really a, a response in some ways to practical, political, and economic conditions, but then it also involved looking to the European avant-garde, basically the CM, uh, to, uh, for, for ideas about how uh, this whole direction should evolve. Once Gropius got to Harvard, he stopped really mentioning CM very much. This has led to a touch of confusion about his role in it. He was a vice president of CM down into the 1950s until its dissolution uh, in 1956. Um, and also many of the students who studied there at the GSD went on uh, to become deans themselves, also uh, using the ideas of uh, Gropius, this idea of, of kind of linking these two disciplines uh, within a modernist framework uh, here at WashU. Uh, Joe Passanow, a Gropius and Hudnut student from the 1940s, was the Dean of Architecture from 1956 to 67, and his successor uh, after uh, George N. Savithius was Constantine Michaelides, who had studied under CERT uh, in the 1950s and was dean here until 1993. Faculty also at WashU uh, coming directly out of that same environment, people like uh, Fumiko Maki and Roger Montgomery, many others uh, teaching here and in other schools across the country. But one of the other complexities of this period is that when CERT arrived in the United States in 1939, much of what was already being built uh, followed really models that it didn't have much to do, uh, you could almost say with architecture, but they were really based on earlier model housing traditions that had developed 
especially in 19th, 19th century London, since the 1840s, uh, had been to some extent uh, influential in New York since the 1850s, uh, a different uh, kind of approach to uh, public housing where the idea really was uh, to eliminate architecture in a sense, to make very practical kinds of environments that would not compete with the private housing market and could easily be read, if you want to take a theoretical position, as having a sort of disciplinary uh, kind of purpose. So the idea here being that these projects were reforming uh, the sort of poor people who would live in them and that the architecture is not really particularly interesting or appealing. And that's not an idea that CERT uh, really or Le Corbusier ever subscribed to. CERT was actually critical of these kinds of projects after he arrived in the United States and in some of his work, as we'll see a little bit later, uh, tried to actually provide different kinds of models uh, for that kind of high density urban housing. Once he arrived in the US though, he also um, immediately saw that um, the whole housing situation was completely different, that uh, suburban development was already becoming kind of the mainstream under the New Deal and uh, started to advocate this idea of modern architecture taking up a new uh, monumentality, really uh, influentially working with the Swiss historian Siegfried Gideon, who was the secretary general of Siam and the French uh, communist painter Fernand Leger uh, to offer nine points on monumentality in 1943. Uh, the idea that there should be a kind of synthesis uh, of the arts working with new technology. This was the era of the Tennessee Valley Authority where large new concrete faced dams were being built across a large region, not only in Tennessee, but in adjacent regions and where uh, muralism was of great interest during the New Deal. And there was a sort of tentative acceptance perhaps of more abstract kinds of murals. Leger uh, actually doing a mural for the uh, Con Ed the New York Electric Company at the New York World's Fair of 1939. So start responding to that context by uh, asking for a new monumentality, moving away from a strictly functional definition of modern architecture with the idea that architecture should somehow continue to evoke an emotional response uh, in the viewer, that it wasn't something that was only about uh, functional problems, but should also have this kind of expressive character. And of course, Eero Sarin's arch here in St. Louis very clear example of this ideal of the new mon monumentality that Gideon would then include in his uh, book, A Decade of Contemporary Architecture, published in 1951, as an example of the new monumentality. Um, the other kind of fact about the United States where Sir Dwyer was, of course, uh, suburban development was taking uh, a form that really had a lot to do with single family houses, detached houses, some of it organized along the lines that Clarence Stein and Henry Wright had proposed at Radburn, New Jersey, this idea of the neighborhood unit uh, where every child could walk to school and there would be a strict separation of pedestrians from vehicular traffic and the vehicular traffic would be sorted out uh, by different speeds from the parkway down to the cul-de-sac street, which was introduced uh, in this project. And then in the 1930s became the kind of mainstream preference of the Federal Housing Administration and their subdivision guidelines where they more or less demanded curvilinear streets and greatly approved the things like cul-de-sacs and this idea of separating, separating out traffic uh, by speed. And you can see uh, enormous impact of those ideas really across North America and then ultimately uh, in other places, uh, Stein's uh, Newtown in Northern British Columbia, a very remote area involving uh, new housing for people working at an aluminum smelter uh, where there's a, a whole transformation of the landscape really kind of continuing the whole direction of the uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. These are the kinds of mainstream directions that CERT found when he arrived uh, in the United States. And I think that kind of accounts for why his book, his first book in English, Can Our City Survive, uh, which put forward these various CM ideas is a little bit vague actually about what the architectural strategies or even planning responses really should be. That there's a lot of critique of existing cities very much in the mainstream of the time, overcrowding, congestion, lack of appropriate uh, playground facilities, um, need for more housing, uh, but the solutions are rather uh, tentatively offered and instead CERT uh, includes two maps from uh, CM4 where uh, the groups uh, representing Detroit and Los Angeles had uh, shown that the, the new kind of city was emerging in North America at this point on a much larger scale than historic European cities. And that way working in a very different environment uh, than the European CM groups. So where the automobile was a key element of transportation and single family or at least low density housing, uh, pretty much the norm. And so CM housing by different groups, uh, three of them in Europe and one in the United States. Uh, but there, I think there was a sense at this point that he wasn't entirely sure really how to respond uh, to this different kind of condition. Very soon, uh, CM begins to take up Le Corbusier's uh, immediate post-war model, 
of um, the unite, which is basically one element of a high rise uh, slab building uh, that was meant to be a whole community of those for the uh, war destroyed town of San Diego, destroyed in the German re retreat at the end of the war. Uh, Le Corbusier proposing uh, to the city fathers this idea of a kind of uh, town that had um, all the housing in these high rise buildings, a pedestrian core. This was a new element really in Siam a walkable space at the center of the city, which in Le Corbusier's version was very opened up, but there wasn't a lot of enclosed space, but a high rise a town hall, a uh, municipal mu museum in the shape of a spiral, so it could be endlessly added on to as the collections grew. This was a Corbusian idea from the late 1920s, a municipal auditorium, and then an arcade uh, of shopping. But all of it, a new concept for Siam, but not something that the uh, people in San Diego were particularly interested in. And so they never built the plan, although today they actually rather proudly display of uh, the model that Le Corbusier had made uh, in the city uh, museum. Um, instead, CERT, I think, decided at this point that in the United States that Siam wasn't necessarily uh, offering the kinds of solutions that um, would be widely accepted. And instead was uh, one of the founders of a group called the American Society of Planners and Architects, this was founded again with Joseph Hudnut, then Dean at Harvard, included a lot of uh, emerging modern architects, Eero Saarinen, I.M. Fay, Marcel Breuer, uh, and others. They met in New York, uh, ultimately kind of inconclusively for a number of years from 1944 uh, into the late 40s. Uh, but you can see in this uh, drawing by Vernon DeMars that there's this idea here of trying to adjust modern architecture to American conditions of varying kinds of housing conditions, and then trying to think about how those might add up into larger sorts of urban pattern. Um, CERT is at that point then starting to offer this idea of what he calls human scale, a term taken from Le Corbusier, uh, the idea that medieval cities, walkable cities provide a kind of model uh, in this uh, increasingly auto-based uh, American context for how modern architecture should go forward. And this I really think is the beginning of uh, urban design for CERT in the way he would then develop it at Harvard a few years later. That it's kind of a response to the American condition of Radburn, of highways, of uh, huge regional projects like the Tennessee Valley Authority to try to find some kind of more coherent pedestrian environment, which he would then try to uh, create in a lot of his cultural work. Before he was able to do those commissions, uh, he was, however, working for a long time in Latin America, where there's almost no built outcome, a few built outcomes, but not many, uh, of a whole lot of urban plans that he did uh, starting in 1944 uh, in Brazil. This was um, the period of what's called the good neighbor policy, where uh, first the Roosevelt and the Truman administration were trying to win over Latin America. This was especially true during World War II, where the US was looking to get Brazil, especially into the war effort on the Allied side. But Brazil had remained neutral, actually had strong commercial ties to both uh, Italy and Germany, as well as to the US. And uh, it took uh, big loan guarantees to convince the Brazilian government uh, to finally declare war on the Axis in 1943. And it's right after that that certain Wiener uh, get this kind of um, commission for a new city around an air airplane engine factory uh, not far from Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they, um, they ultimately don't get to build the project. There's a lot of resistance uh, to their being there. It had been intended to be, uh, the architect had intended to be someone named Atulio Lima, who is a, a, a Brazilian architect, and uh, he died suddenly. And so certain Wiener were then uh, brought in. Wiener had connections to the U.S. Uh, State Department. He was married to the daughter of Henry Morgenthau, uh, who was the uh, Secretary of State at the time. Uh, but uh, the Brazilians, I think, were not very happy with uh, American architects, I think immigrate American architects, the Wiener had been born in Germany, uh, doing this project. And so uh, the project never went anywhere. But it was widely publicized by CERT uh, in uh, things like Progressive Architecture, one of the leading architectural journals of the time. Uh, the idea here was a kind of internal critique, I think, of uh, Le Corbusier's San Diego project, where uh, CERT and Wiener proposed this idea of a more enclosed civic center, looking more to traditional Latin American town squares, modifying that uh, with uh, more attention to landscape, a relationship to the river nearby. They would propose a set of canals uh, that would run uh, across the site, uh, thus intermingling the housing with landscape in ways that would anticipate search efforts in urban design to combine the landscape with urbanism uh, in rebuilding cities. There's also a strong focus on a pedestrian access. You can see the, the bridge that goes over the highway to the soccer stadium and that goes through a, a paseo of, uh, of shops. And so uh, there's efforts here to try to retain some of the active street life, which of course anyone who ever goes to Latin America or increasingly parts of North America today, you can find 
uh, that happens often late into the evening in a very different way than in Anglo-American kinds of environments. And so uh, that's a um, an aspect of this Latin American work that to me has always been quite interesting, but itself also controversial in the um, in the Latin American context because very much part of these what became Cold War strategies to uh, try to keep Latin American governments uh, somehow more connected uh, to uh, American developments at the same time. A certain wiener then moving on to Lima, where they worked uh, for a democratically elected government uh, in the post-war period in the late, in late 1940s, uh, doing proposals for the center of Lima, which again weren't uh, carried out. In this project, Ernesto Rogers, the Italian CM member, uh, also uh, working with them. He was active in South America at the same time, working on Tucumán University in Argentina uh, around the same point. Very interesting early megastructure, part of which was actually uh, constructed. Uh, after that, um, uh, Town Planning Associates, as the firm was called, uh, did a new town on the uh, Peruvian uh, Pacific coast, a, town, a kind of uh, industrial port called Chimpote. Uh, it was um, not built as they designed it. It was a very fast growing industrial city at that moment. But here they also even more radically tried to modify Le Corbusier's Sandier model by proposing uh, low rise courtyard houses as the main form of the neighborhood unit. And so this was something that then became important for CERT uh, thereafter, this idea of the patio house, uh, the sort of uh, relating in some ways to indigenous uh, forms of housing uh, in Peru, and then also forms of housing in uh, Spain, which were then brought to the new world. Very interesting hybridity of those forms in some old uh, Peruvian urban environments. CERT uh, using that as the, uh, the basic uh, model here, and then also trying to adapt this to the new Pan American Highway, which was being built uh, through the site. That was the only part that was actually constructed was the highway. Uh, and then adjacent to that, a, a pedestrian civic center uh, with a bridge over to these um, low rise neighborhood units. So basically a new model of uh, modernist urbanism, something that uh, CERT would then continue to try to offer even as Dean at Harvard, never really getting much success with that in the United States, but having a fairly significant influence on Peruvian self-build uh, this was a period right after that where uh, Fernando Belo Terry, who later became the president of Peru in the 1960s, it was at that time an architect and a, and a congressman uh, in Peru. He started to advocate this idea uh, for uh, organized self care that uh, many of the members of the Peruvian military were not able to find housing around booming cities like Lima. And so uh, Belo Terry and others started to advocate the idea that uh, they could more or less take the land that wasn't really being well occupied and they could then uh, start to uh, build their own housing, but in a way that would be organized along lines that are pretty close in some ways uh, to Chimbote, this idea of the courtyard house uh, as the basic form, and also at the same time accommodating highways and automobile infrastructure. Very interesting outcomes of that in Peru, uh, which you, one can visit if you go there. Uh, something that later John F.C. Turner in his book, Freedom to Build, the English architect, uh, would advocate as a kind of worldwide model of self built housing in the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, Town Planning Associates then going on to Venezuela and, and Colombia, where they um, were able to build a little bit in, in Venezuela, the Maracaibo, a whole sector there built. I'm not, I've never been able to visit it. I don't know what condition it's in uh, today. Uh, but it was really Chimbote that uh, CERT offered as a kind of model for um, urbanization and for SIAM uh, in these post war period as he became president of SIAM in 1947. Uh, Town Planning Associates also active uh, in Colombia, in Medellin, and in Cali, uh, proposing civic centers based on this idea of historic uh, Latin American town centers, the Plaza at Cusco, one of the models CERT would use uh, in CM uh, to illustrate this idea, and then also uh, the old urban fabric, which was increasingly being destroyed uh, in many of these cities like Bogota, as they were rapidly developing international air service coming in the late 40s. Uh, Colombia briefly, a really booming country, and then uh, divided by a civil war that lasted for decades, uh, pretty incredibly violent, actually called La Violencia, uh, that uh, ultimately then morphed into the war with the uh, with the FARC, with the drug dealers in the countryside. So uh, very complex histories of uh, politically polarized, uh, where certain wiener ended up kind of in the middle of a lot of these situations and very few of these plans uh, ever carried out. But many of them influential on CERT's ideas of uh, urban design after he became dean of Harvard in 1953, uh, the idea of the neighborhood sector that he and Wiener had developed uh, in Bogota, walkable pedestrian areas that would include housing, but also uh, various kinds of social services where there would be uh, efforts to uh, think about uh, how those could be organized in ways where the school, for example, or a health clinic could be very accessible and walkable uh, to the various kinds of housing for different kinds of groups. 
Um, they also worked with Le Corbusier on the Bogota plan. Uh, he was brought in in 1950. Uh, he was mainly concerned with the monumental four proposed that turned out to be very expensive new high rises adjacent to the capital of Colombia in the center of Bogota. Uh, but the uh, the planning effort was something that had a certain amount of seriousness to it. A whole Colombian CIAM group uh, was formed at this point. Some of them very distinguished architects in their own right, designing this early uh, reinforced concrete stadium in Cartagena, largely unknown in the history of architecture, but important in the history of Colombian architecture. And certain Wiener also proposing uh, what we today would call an urban growth barrier around Bogota, uh, trying to keep the city from sprawling. It was beginning to grow in all directions at this point. And uh, the idea was to redesign it as a series of 35 sectors, walkable sectors, uh, bounded by greenways and highways, which would keep its growth uh, within that area. And then the growth could then be high rise, some of which occurred, although ultimately uh, the government, had, the mayor that had sponsored that uh, was voted out and his successors uh, instead brought in Skidmore and Merrill, who did a more uh, kind of um, uh, detached uh, suburban uh, office complex out toward the new airport, basically encouraging a whole kind of growth corridor uh, in that direction. Very interesting urban history that Colombians uh, have studied very carefully, actually, and uh, certain wiener quite significant uh, at a point in all of that. Um, all of this, of course, happening in the context of the Cold War, which really gets going around 1948 with the division of Europe, the dividing of Berlin. Um, and so uh, certain wieners work then, I think, begins to be uh, more difficult in some ways for them in Latin America, where their politics don't exactly fit uh, either side uh, of that divide. Uh, it's at this point, really, that England starts to be more of the main focus. Um, the English uh, CM group Mars, uh, very large and successful right after World War II. Uh, the London County Council starts taking up uh, Corbusian ideas in a big way, uh, building uh, far more housing of that kind than Le Corbusier himself was ever able to build. And for a whole generation in Britain in the 1950s, there's a kind of Corbusian architectural culture, which uh, familiar figures like Kenneth Frampton or Alan Cahoon uh, are very much a part of that whole post-war British effort, where there was a kind of socialist government in Britain down to 1951, and uh, a real commitment to a kind of rehousing of uh, the British working class. For that reason, Le Corbusier actually wanted to have CM8 uh, in Britain again, even though CM6 had been held there as well. The circuit advocated strongly for Bogota or Havana as places uh, for the HCM Congress to be held, which in a way would have made sense given not just their work, but a lot of the very interesting work that was going on there at that point in Brazil and other countries. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was held in England outside of London in a town called Hoddesdon, right as the County of London plan and the Greater London plan were beginning to be applied. These were big regional plans that called for new towns, many of which were actually built to uh, kind of pull the industrial uh, uses and populations out of the city uh, continuing garden city kinds of ideas where these were compact, relatively walkable uh, settlements out beyond a green belt, which was actually put in place legislatively and still exists uh, in England around London. And so there's a kind of effort to uh, reorganize London along garden city lines, but using uh, some of the strategies of modern architecture, not considered ultimately very successful architecturally. A lot of the uh, resistance uh, to CM develops out of a hostility uh, to the work of some of these Mars Group members like Frederick Gibbard and others, uh, once well-known firms in England that grew young, almost uh, completely uh, untested architects like Allison and Peter Smithson, who developed huge followings because they're in resistance to this kind of mainstream uh, CM modern architecture right after World War II. So interesting histories around all of that. It's only a background really to CERT's work and to CM8, the heart of the city, where CERT proposes that theme and uh, really very clearly puts forward this whole idea of the importance of historic centers. If Gideon gives a talk about the kind of genealogy going back to the Roman forums and through uh, places like the Piazza San Marco in Venice or the Campidoglio in Rome, the importance of these kinds of spaces to culture, to face-to-face -face, uh, encounter, to uh, as kind of active political life, which was really much of the intention of certain Gideon at this point, that they weren't particularly advocating the hyper-commercialization of these cities that, that is in some cases since happened, uh, or hyper-tourism, but more the idea that uh, the kind of totally suburban uh, patterns and the completely functionalist architecture, which is really where a lot of modernism was going at that point, uh, needed to in some ways be modified. And so that then set up a lot of debates uh, within CM, leading ultimately to the emergence of Team 10. Uh, Ernesto Rogers, also uh, part of that, a Milan architect, uh, led uh, the Italy during World War II and to Switzerland and came back uh, and uh, continues his firm BBPR, uh, designing uh, some, one of the first skyscrapers in Milan and uh, also other contextual kinds of buildings that he 
along with Robert Venturi in the United States, was really the first advocates of this idea of contextualism, that um, there should be some relationship between new buildings and the historic context. In that sense, really going beyond what Sirk himself was proposing, which was more about modernist civic centers that were walkable, as opposed to this um, idea that maybe there should be some actual literal replication of historic forms uh, in new buildings. And that ultimately led to a debate, so which again is a little tangential to CERT, but uh, CM broke up uh, in some ways over these issues and at CM 59, uh, which in some ways wasn't even really a CM Congress, but organized by Team 10, uh, Allison and Peter Smithson harshly criticized Ernesto Rogers and the uh, Corey Velasca as a kind of betrayal of modern architecture, really ending a lot of the possibility of these kinds of conversations uh, to uh, continue. Sert's own situation in the US was actually quite different. He was um, very much aware of the uh, Mies direction in Chicago, Mies van der Rohe moving there from Germany in 1938 to becoming the director of architecture at IIT. And it was during that period that a kind of Miesian approach to high rises caught, all, caught on in the United States. Uh, Skidmore, Owens and Merrill moving in that direction, the firm founded in Chicago in the 1930s, and then after the war, uh, taking up this kind of Miesian direction in buildings like Lever House in New York, the first glass wall, the uh, commercial office tower, in some ways anticipate, or some ways following some of Sert's ideas that he had sketched in 1947 of this idea of a slab and podium uh, kind of building. And there actually were some exchanges between SOM and Sert, although I've never been able to find any detailed documentation of it uh, at this point. Uh, but Sert very aware uh, of all of that and also uh, of what was going on at the GSD before he became Dean. A lot of interest there in rebuilding uh, American cities, new uh, civic centers, um, Ian McCard, the landscape architect, uh, later at Penn, uh, part of a team which included Robert Geddes, who's still alive today, uh, a Philadelphia architect uh, and others, uh, where they did a group thesis on downtown Providence, Rhode Island, uh, as a kind of uh, modernist pedestrian kind of environment. It was also at the GSD that um, I.M. Pei had studied and his later associate, Harry Cobb, uh, did a thesis uh, that uh, anticipated a lot of the uh, architecture of the 1960s and kind of set out some of the directions that the Pei firm would then implement uh, really more successfully than CERT uh, in the 1950s. CERT himself still very much involved with town planning associates at this point. Um, this idea of these low rise uh, pedestrian uh, kind of patio house on sorts of places. He advocated these ideas in Architectural Forum in 1953 uh, in an article called Can Patios Make Cities? Uh, in this case, using examples from Havana where the firm had started working in 1953. Uh, they worked there before Castro uh, came to power in 1959 and um, were very extensively involved actually in planning in Havana uh, at that point. Uh, by that time, CERT had become the dean at Harvard, um, had introduced this idea of urban design, building and all these ideas, uh, which I just uh, outlined. One of his uh, early students was uh, Fumihiko Maki, uh, who came directly from Japan. He'd gone to Cranbrook, but it was after Eliel Saarinen had died and he found that not much interesting was really going on there. So then he went on and got a second master's degree at the GSD. Uh, he did this thesis uh, for faculty housing with CERT, where you can see a lot of these patio house uh, ideas also being applied. Um, CERT also uh, brought in visitors uh, to the GSD, Ernesto Rogers taught there, and also the young Paul Rudolph, at the time a Florida architect who had graduated uh, from the GSD, was uh, working in Florida and Sarasota, where he did a lot of quite interesting houses, many of which still exist. Uh, he won a competition uh, for the uh, new art center at Wellesley College, where you can see, I think, fairly really strongly the influence of uh, BBPR, of kind of Italian CM ideas, very decorative uh, kinds of ideas uh, that Rudolph would then abandon a few years later with his Yale Art and Architecture building, uh, which then uh, kind of launched his career as a brutalist architect uh, in the 1960s. But very interesting interchanges and connections. Unfortunately, a lot of them not documented, but a lot of people in the same place at the same time uh, throughout this uh, whole period. And CERT, of course, uh, continuing and developing urban design for GSD. I've written about that in a book called Defining Urban Design. I won't go into detail about it, but um, one of the interesting aspects of that also, uh, CERT bringing in Jacqueline Turek, the British uh, planner who had been one of the organizers of CM8, who had been teaching in Toronto. Uh, he brought her to uh, the GSD, where she became one of the first full-time women faculty in planning, and um, ultimately had a big, a big role in global planning, uh, working uh, at the uh, UN seminar in New Delhi in 1953. It's at a point where American administration is very much trying to uh, promote housing and modernization and what was starting to be called the third world 
Uh, at that time, uh, the Prime Minister of India, Nehru, uh, building Chandigarh, uh, he commissioned um, Fry and Drew, a British firm, also CM members, who then they brought in with the Vizier uh, to, uh, to do the final design. But very much a, a kind of um, key point where uh, lots of ideas about tropical architecture, Fry and Drew publishing a book of that title uh, in 1956, which included a number of certain Wieners, uh, Latin American projects in it, uh, a new concern for um, lots of things that then have become mainstream uh, in architecture. Fry grew also very active in West Africa, uh, de designing a new uh, campus at uh, Ibadan in Nigeria uh, that was in some ways a kind of model uh, for this kind of um, modernization in Africa at that time. Uh, Sir himself interested also in working internationally. This was a point where the State Department was starting to uh, sponsor uh, new embassies, uh, hiring the latest uh, modern architects uh, to do them. Uh, CERT got the commission for what was then uh, the Baghdad Embassy, someone who used as the Baghdad Embassy, uh, where he was able to uh, also uh, develop and explore various ideas, not only about landscape and about uh, canal systems, which he had used earlier in unbuilt uh, projects in Latin America, uh, but also uh, various ideas of uh, passive uh, heating and cooling. Uh, the uh, office building uh, used these ceramic sunscreens, louvered shutters, and uh, had this double roof layer. So very interesting project really in terms of um, connecting urban design landscape uh, to much, what's in much more contemporary kinds of ideas about uh, building uh, in what we would today call a more sustainable kind of way, not a term that was used uh, at the time, but sort of introducing the idea of environmental design as it was called uh, into the GSD in the early 50s. He also uh, continued to pursue his uh, practice, um, getting this commission for a studio for his friend Juan Moreau, uh, also in the Balearic Islands uh, in 1954. And then uh, in France, a, um, a new kind of museum inspired uh, by the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, the idea of a kind of a museum that was more like a kind of house where uh, there would be a close connection between indoor and outdoor, uh, that the artworks would not necessarily be that numerous, but they would be uh, very carefully positioned in relation to each other. And it would include things like a cafe and a bookstore, ideas that many other galleries and museums have subsequently taken up possibly too much so uh, into the present. But uh, this is all very new idea in 1957. Uh, the, um, the founder of the Fondation Mark had been a, a member of the French resistance and had supported modern architects uh, through World War II, very significant cultural institution uh, in this area of the Riviera, uh, not that far uh, from Nice. And so um, the Giacometti sculptures uh, in the courtyard, various other, uh, the large uh, Miro uh, sculpture garden, various other works, uh, all still easily visited today if you find yourself uh, in that area. Uh, but all of this actually being criticized pretty heavily uh, in Siam and in, in what became Team 10 at this point, that uh, people like the Smithsons, uh, Aldo van Eyck in um, uh, Holland, uh, these were people that uh, were all very critical in some ways of uh, this whole direction of Siam and really were trying to propose uh, a different uh, focus for it. And so uh, Siam breaks up in 1956, uh, CERT uh, then goes on to a kind of a fa later phase in his American career as a dean and also as an advocate of urban design uh, in uh, the context of the GSD, where the first Harvard Urban Design Conference uh, is a setting where you find um, comparisons between Victor Bruin's uh, proposals for Fort Worth, uh, Khan and um, Ed Bacon working in Philadelphia and this kind of idea of introducing modern architecture into existing neighborhoods rather than demolishing them. All those ideas then leading uh, to various uh, outcomes uh, in urban design. Uh, also, it's at this point that you find um, to do attention really to the racial changes that were happening in American cities at this point. Uh, that there starts to be uh, at least people pointing out like Charles Abrams, a New York housing reformer, uh, that um, there's a new kind of population that through the Great Migration that wasn't called that at the time that was moving in uh, to American cities and that this is changing a lot of the urban dynamics, something that would continue to be a sort of crisis issue actually right down to the present. And so urban design turns out not to be able to solve that, but nonetheless, uh, there's a, a new focus really on various urban projects that are compared in, in different uh, urban design conferences, which last really down until 1970, there are 13 of them uh, at, in all. Search work in Latin America also ends at this point. Uh, he does design a presidential palace uh, for the dictator of Cuba at the time, Batista, uh, very interesting ecologically in terms of his design, not actually built. Uh, and uh, town planning associates then breaks up really uh, in 1959 and they don't, they try to work with Castro but they don't actually get any work from the Castro regime and that's pretty much the end of CERT's uh, Latin American involvement. So that he then becomes very significant architect uh, on the Harvard campus and I won't go into a lot of detail about that. 
involved in planning you know, the Harvard campus, Holyoke Center building uh, that fortunately still exists there. It's been modified in ways that I'm somewhat critical of, but at least the building has largely been uh, preserved. And um, the internal arcade was, was taken out. You can't actually see that anymore. And that's kind of a key aspect of the project. But nonetheless, the building has been carefully restored and preserved. And certainly that's true also with Peabody Terrace, with Emiliano Lopez, who's written a whole book recently which was published uh, about uh, Peabody Terrace, a very interesting book to look at. Hopefully we'll have an English translation uh, before too long. And uh, some of CERT's other projects haven't fared as well. The school for Peabody Terrace, unfortunately, uh, taken down uh, unnecessarily a while ago. Uh, but CERT's own house certainly very much uh, preserved and, and lived in by people who have, have maintained it uh, extremely well. Uh, so a lot of those projects are quite familiar. Also, other aspects of that whole period still very influential. Uh, this whole idea of uh, using uh, digital technologies just emerging at that time uh, to think about low-rise high-density housing, to Shemaya, to Plata, to GSD, uh, and then later at Yale, and Christopher Alexander, the kind of originator of the pattern language approach uh, at Berkeley uh, in the mid-60s, also a kind of key figure in er early digital directions. All these ideas circulating in the 60s at the same time as Team 10, the same time as Maki's um, uh, work on group form, which is pu published here, uh, at uh, Washu in 1964, all these directions all happening, I think in some ways as outcomes of this whole urban design direction that had begun uh, at uh, Harvard under CERT in the mid 1950s. Um, so I know we're kind of running out of time here, so I won't go into a lot of detail about these late projects. You can certainly look uh, in the CERT uh, books about them, many of them really quite interesting in various ways. Some of them uh, ultimately in Ibiza where CERT retires and does uh, various projects that reflect his interest uh, in the vernacular uh, there he starts to publish a book about the vernacular, uh, which is never uh, completed, but there's an essay in CERT writings uh, about that. But all of it starts to be challenged uh, by new ways of thinking, Jane Jacobs, uh, kind of rejection of modernism by postmodernism, things we're all familiar with uh, from that point onward. Also, uh, social upheaval in, in the 1960s, the Vietnam War, the focus of protests, uh, CERT uh, retires from the GSD, which was the center really of a lot of that campus uh, agitation. Uh, in the late 60s, and then gets a kind of last American commission on Roosevelt Island, uh, part of a, of a new town in town that um, assert really very, very innovatively here, uh, designing a project that was 30% uh, for non-white uh, people living there, also included elderly housing and uh, healthcare and school facilities uh, integrated into the building. So there's a lot of attention to different kinds of groups really continuing very directly the same kinds of ideas that he had introduced in his Bogota plan uh, in the late 1940s here actually built, although in a rather limited way, and then very quickly the UDC goes bankrupt in 1975. And there's a whole rejection then after that uh, of this kind of whole idea of architecture really having a strong role uh, in urban rebuilding or in these kinds of projects. There are many other outcomes though that parallel it. Uh, people who graduated from the GSD, uh, Bond Ryder, the firm that was founded uh, by Max Bond, one of the leading uh, black architects of the period, um, and all kinds of outcomes then uh, in American urbanism from that point onward. Sir himself, I think, pretty much uh, retires from that, although this last project that fortunately was called to my attention by uh, Emiliano Lopez that actually built in Barcelona a very interesting luxury project with these duplexes, uh, again, reflecting a lot of Sir's uh, ideas, but in this case, not becoming a full urban design, the other parts of the site uh, built out by other architects. So I think with that, uh, basically, um, that's where we'll leave it. But um, I'm happy to take questions. And I think it's really, it's kind of an ongoing question really about CERT's ideas, their applicability uh, in the present. Uh, how, what, was, what should we think about them uh, today? So Eric, we, we already have a, a question in. Okay. Um, so from, uh, from uh, Bob Kahn. Um, uh, I'll just read it out. Uh, Eric, thank you for this wonderful talk. Are you aware of Klaus Herdegg's book, The Decorated Diagram, Harvard yeah. and the Failure of the Bauhaus Legacy? Yeah, yeah. I am aware of that book. And, um, you know, I, I, it's, I think in some ways well taken for the Gropius era. Um, this idea that uh, basically they, they were designing what's called the Harvard box and then just decorating it. I don't think it's as applicable to CERT. And I think that there's still an ongoing debate about, or even maybe even a lack of understanding about what CERT was about as the dean of the GSD. I know Robert A.M. Stern still dismisses that whole period, um, but I, I really think there's more there than people give CERT credit for. All right, so Bob also had a follow-up question. Um, 
uh, what are your thoughts of CERT's contributions to the Carpenter Center and how much influence uh, he may or may not have had? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think the design is Le Corbusier's and not CERT's, but I think the use of concrete there is really um, kind of a product of the CERT Jackson office. I don't know if it's CERT himself, but I, I was just thinking that should really be looked at more carefully because we tend to see that kind of carefully finished, you know, concrete that shows the board formwork as something that Khan develops and Khan's associates at the Salk Institute. But really the Carpenter Center is also is also that, and, and as is Holyoke Center. So I think that there's more there that would be really interesting. Um, all right, up in the chat from William Wallace. Um, uh, thank you, Eric, wonderful. I love the nine points of monumentality. Uh, which is the first, uh, or which is the first or most important, and why? Um, give me a second so I can get them in front of me, okay? Okay. <laughs> Fortunately, I have Joan Ockland's book <laughs> that has the minutes, um, which is a great resource for this whole period. Um, and it's actually the first uh, th text in the book. Well, I think I might say really the first point is the most important point because it says monuments are human landmarks, which men have created as symbols for their ideals, for their aims and for their actions. So there's right away an idea of architecture as having a kind of human intent that it's about something that people can understand or react to, which doesn't mean it's always positive by any means. But I think that probably is the most important point that in a lot of functionalism, there tends to be a certain disappearance, you could say, of the human subject. And so I think this is an effort to kind of Put that back in in, in some way. So, I've well, got a, a question from uh, Bruce Lindsay. Uh, could you talk more about CERT's influence on architectural education? Yeah, I think um, a lot of what we take for granted in architectural education, I think in some ways, is a result of CERT's uh, ideas this integration of architecture, landscape, and planning. Um, the idea of bringing in the arts, which he did at GSD. Um, Gropius was much more hesitant about that, partly because when Gropius was the chair, there was still a lot of debate uh, about whether they should have a Bauhaus base course. And Hudnut was actually against that. He was a modernizer, but he thought a base course wasn't suitable for grownups and that people would be sitting there and making things. And, you know, <laughs> it's a weird idea. But, um, but so Cert really changed all that. And he, he definitely, um, you know, made the arts significant. Uh, he also, put a, a new stress on history. Gropius had been very suspicious of history and um, because he thought students would just continue to copy historic forms. Um, it was Sert who brought in Gideon and then Gideon brought in Edward Seckler. Sorry about my dog barking in the back of it. Um, uh, Edward Seckler who taught for years at the GSD with an idea that history was not about copying but was really about understanding the design ideas behind different approaches which I think is still really the mainstream of architectural history in, in architecture schools. So I think in those areas beyond urban design CERT was also very important. Excellent. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, no more questions coming in right now. So, um, looks like is there some stuff in the chat? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I was I was checking the chat and the Q and A. Yeah. Great. Okay. No, that's great. Um, well, I hope people enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. So. Yeah, that was an amazing amount of information, Eric. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Your knowledge is, is incredible. <laughs> there, there, there are a lot of books, <laughs> and not just mine, that you can you can find out more about all of it. So. Yeah. Right, but um, yeah, but you, you had all that <laughs> organized and making these incredible connections uh, across you know many architects that we're familiar with, but not always um, familiar with uh, how they were connected. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. well, I find that endlessly fascinating myself, and there's all kinds of other areas of research one can do on it. So yeah, yeah. Well, very good. Okay. Thanks so much, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm sure I'll see you, many of you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Chandler and Robert also. <laughs>